Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Thank you. Well done. Um, my name's Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, as we're gathering on this cold, snowy day where, you know, it was a, it was a chore to be here, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your, your desire to gather with, with the church and to worship our risen Lord. Um, we're going to sing a few songs and open the scriptures together in Job and be taught and encouraged uh, about the Lord, who he is, what he's done, and what that means to us. So uh, I'm going to pray. You can stand uh, after that and we'll sing together. And uh, That's it. Lord Jesus, thank you for for living, for dying, and for living again. Thank you for giving us the gospel through the scriptures, through your disciples. Thank you for the examples of, of simple, broken men and women throughout history who have uh, done inspiring and amazing things, not because of their own worth or merit, but because of, of your work and and the empowerment that you you provide for us through your Holy Spirit. So um, your obedience, Lord, to the will of the Father, of your Father, uh, is a model that we want to take and obey you, Lord Jesus. So may our hearts today be submissive and teachable and humble so that... Uh, that you can more easily, you, can, you have the power to overpower our hearts and wills regardless of our resistance, so it's not a matter of us having to cooperate. You will do what you will do. But may, may we enter into uh, this time together already having you prepared our hearts and with a spirit of willingness and openness to, to be taught and learn and to grow and to be rebuked and... Uh, and through that, Lord, we know that you will be most glorified um, and we will be most satisfied in us. Not through our achievements, Lord, but through our humility, by your grace. Amen. All right, stand with me and sing. I thought about... Um, it's just me, so some, some folks are out and sick and whatnot. So I thought about doing this with uh, a pitch pipe today, like, and then we all just sing. That would be fun. Um, but no, you should thank me later for not, not leading you today with the instrument of a pitch pipe. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him.
shall rise and set no more. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Lord Jesus, thank you for paying our debt and washing us white as snow. Amen? Thanks. Good morning. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Josh, one of the pastors here. Add my welcome to the others, particularly if you're visiting with us. We'd love to connect with you, and I'll be up front after our worship gathering to say hi and introduce myself. If you've got to run, it would really help to fill out one of those Connect cards and drop it in the box on the sides, and, and uh, we'll reach out to you this week. Go ahead and find your way to Job 25 and 26, just about the middle of your Bible. We'll have it on the screen as well. As we continue our, our study through the book, a study of Job is really a study of God. It was God who, um, when calling all of the angels together to enter his presence, allowed Satan to join the group. We read about in chapter 1. It was God who allows Satan to go relatively wherever he wants, whenever he wants, doing what he wants. It was God who first brought Job up in the conversation and said to, to Satan, Have you considered the integrity of my servant Job, that there's no one like him on earth in regards to faith and obedience? It was God who gave Satan the permission slip to go and kill all ten of Job's kids and to take away Job's health. And it was God who, after the fact, retreated back into the shadows and didn't say a word for 35 chapters. He doesn't talk in any way of encouragement or explanation. He doesn't show up in dreams even, or visions saying, Job, hang in there, or assure him of his continued presence with Job in his suffering. He doesn't tell him how long this is going to last, or if anything else is coming, or some of the, the purpose of this plan. He not only stays absent, he remains absolutely silent. So much that even in these millennia later, in 2021, as we open this, this book and read, just in a cursory manner, we struggle at seeing God act like this. 
Some of you who grew up in Christian homes have been told your whole life that God loves you, that He's a good God, that He's kind, and that He forgives sin. Even in a culture that, that isn't necessarily Christian, when they entertain thoughts it, that if God exists, He's benevolent, He shows compassion on the hurting and the weak and the poor. But when we come up with a careful and honest study of this book, just get into the details of what is going on and and. and and the longer we're in it, and the deeper we get into it, we have to say that all that's called into question. We have to admit that either we've been told a wrong story about God, or we've not been understanding the whole story about Job. And it might surprise you to hear that I think it's the former. I think that, that we've been taught or we've, we've failed to develop our, on our own a, a biblical, full, um, robust, theological view of the, the real God. I, I think that most, perhaps you, have an incomplete view of what God is like. Before we get into Job 25 and 26, I, I want you to put on the screen there Romans eleven thirty three, one One of my favorite verses. And to help this sink in, I want you to read it with me. We're going to read it slow. I'll lead. But real slowly, read this with me. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Read that again, not out loud. And in your mind's eye, underline unsearchable and inscrutable. It doesn't mean that God isn't loving and compassionate and forgiving and benevolent and kind. That verse just says that alongside those traits, you need to have insearchable and inscrutable. That we have to realize that there are things about this deep, infinite God that we have on our hands that not only have we not been taught... There are things about Him that we can never know or understand. And again, the longer we're in this book and the more we get into it, we realize what some of those things are. In the words of a longtime Dallas Seminary President, John Wolverd, who once told his students when doing theology, don't try to unscrew the inscrutable. But we want to. To which I reply, but we can't. We, we can know him fully, or excuse me, we can know him truly. We can know him rightly. We can know him personally. But we can't know him exhaustively or fully. Yes, we're told to think his thoughts after him. Yes, we're told to treasure his words and his ways in our hearts and to pursue them like hidden treasures. But he's unfathomable. And what is... Part of being human and Him being God is, is learning to accept that. More than that, to embrace that. More than that, to love that about Him. 
But our tendency is, is to want to, to make him scrutable. And so we, we tend to, to want to manage him and talk about him and think about him and define him and explain him in ways that check all of the boxes and, and cause us to be comfortable with him. Even so comfortable that we can tell him what, what he ought to do in accordance with who he is and what he's like. And the way that we typically do this is we, we take our human traits and our human experience and we sort of supersize them into deity. For example, God is eternal. No beginning, no end, self-sufficient, self-existent being. And so we picture him as being really old. Or he's omniscient. He knows everything. And so he's, he's the smartest being that we can imagine. Or he's omnipresent everywhere at the same time. And so we view him as really big. So that he's sort of in touch with everything that can be touched. That's, that's not who he's like, or who he is, or what he's like. He's not a little like us. He's not like us, but just more of it and better at it. He's nothing like us. In the words of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, some of you have memorized this. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I mean, let's face it. We can't even fully understand ourselves. Even less one another. And when it comes to God, unfathomable, unsearchable inscrutable. Those are the words. A.W. Tozer writes, Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get Him where we can use Him, or at least know where He is when we need Him. We want a God we can in some measure control, because we need the feeling of security that comes from knowing what God is like, and what he is like is, of course, a composite of all the religious pictures we have seen, all the best people we have known or heard about, and all the sublime ideas we have entertained. If we learn nothing else about Job, let's learn that we will never fully understand all of his ways. And that we need to stop acting like we can. And if Job's friends would have acknowledged that. They would have been so encouraging, so comforting to their friend who has gone through this suffering. If they would have just come and put their arms around him and said, those same questions you're asking, we're asking. The same lack of answers that you have, we're equally in the dark. God is doing something so big and deep and high and mysterious and complex that, that all we can do is wait and trust and watch and encourage one another. And as long as you're in this, no matter what comes or how long it lasts, you need to know we're here with you, buddy. We're not going nowhere. We're sticking around. We're going to meet some practical, tangible needs as we can. But that's as far as we're able to go. And that's a good word for us because in the rest, for the rest of our lives, bank on it, some of us will get cancer. Some of us will lose jobs. Some marriages will go badly. Someone's house perhaps may burn down. Some of you may be infertile. Why? I don't know. And I can't screw it. And neither can you. 
And some people hear me say things like that, and you say, Josh, if you believe that, then you've got a God who is mean and capricious and mean-spirited and cruel. And I say, if you believe that, you believe the Bible. Because you don't have to go very far, and you don't have to be very smart to realize that sometimes God doesn't heal His people. Sometimes people die way too young, including children. Sometimes people are not able to just easily move through life very quickly. Even the faithful ones, even the godly ones, even the believing ones. God gives us life as it really is, and He reveals Himself as He really is. And it is not some American dream version of God and life. Of a grandfather who just dotes on us. Or again, the American dream version that you're smart and you're capable and you're strong and you're creative and if you just work hard and you stay at it, then you can be whoever you want to be and you can do whatever you want to do. You chase that dream and God will cheer you on. Can I say it this way? God doesn't give a rip about your dreams. That might be our next t-shirt. God doesn't give a rip about your dreams. You know why? Because your dream's too weak. He wants to give you himself. And he wants to make you like Jesus. And that process, that path, includes a lot of different suffering. A lot of different disappointments and loss. But Bildad doesn't share a Romans 11, Isaiah 55 view of God's unfathomability. He thinks he's got God tied up with a nice neat bow. And he can explain everything to, to Job. And a lot of this is actually true, but it's of absolute no help. To Job. Look at some of it. Verse 1, we read, Bildad, the Shuhite, answered and said, Dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heavens. That's true. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his light not rise? That's true. How then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? That's true. There is none who, who is righteous, not even one. In iniquity my mother conceived me. We are born sinners. We have sinful natures and therefore we sin. No man is born pure. That's true. Bildad's right. Behold, even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm. Let's make a couple just basic Bible observations of this six-verse chapter. First, this is the last time we're going to hear from Bildad. Thank God. This is also the shortest chapter in the book. Thank God. Both probably because the conversation's run out of steam. There's not much left to say. And when you call somebody a maggot and a worm, the conversation's kind of over. And the third thing I would say is that he doesn't really give any reasons for these things. He's just, he's just lecturing. Nice easy outline would be verses 1, 2, and 3. God is great. Verses 4, 5, and 6, man is sinful. Or you could say, God is light. Job, you're dark. God is right. Job, you're wrong. God is good. Job, you stink. Maggot and worm pretty much says it all. 
You feel for the guy yet and his best friends? I would venture to say that nobody in here has ever called or been called a maggot in this room. And yet Bildad's final statement in sacred scripture for all God's people for history to read is that kind of, kind of slander. I don't have to go very far to apply this, and now's probably a good time before we get into chapter 26. But when you have an opportunity to minister to people, you've got the privilege of having the, the ear of someone who needs to hear truth and comfort about God. That you are in the room as a representative of, of the church of Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ himself, and you're trafficking in theology and Bible verses, whether it be in person or online or whatever. Calling people names and making fun of them never helps. Never. D.A. Carson, who is a theology professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and the founder of the Gospel Coalition group, speaks to our current cultural moment by saying, when you're hating everybody and denouncing everybody and seeking political solutions to everything, it's very difficult to evangelize, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's very difficult to give counsel like that. It's very hard to be friends with anybody like that. But if you do counsel people like this, then you can expect to get a response like Job gives in chapter 26. Then Job answered and said, this is all, you can just feel the sarcasm just dripping off of the letters here. How you have helped him. Who has no power. How you have saved the arm that has no strength. How you have counseled him who has no wisdom. And plentifully declared sound knowledge. With whose help have you uttered words. And whose breath has come out from you. Bildad. I mean I'm just dumber than a bag of hammers. And I'm sicker than a dog. And I don't have any idea what's going on. And wow the Holy Spirit has so empowered you. You're just speaking such truth and wisdom and counsel and encouragement. Thank you. Obviously it's a, it's a joke. In verse 2, 3, and 4 you can't necessarily see it in English. It's singular you. He's talking to Bildad. But in chapter 27, it becomes plural, and so he begins to address all of his other friends, Eliphaz and Zophar and, and Elihu. But for now, it's, it's Bildad, and he is giving as good as, as he gets. He is honestly telling him how he feels and what he thinks, which happens when you're sick. Ask any nurse. Ask any physician. When a person is so sick they're in the hospital and you put them in a gown that's about the fourth the size as it needs to be, you're feeding them cafeteria food, they tend to lose tact. When a person is extremely sick, I don't care how stubborn, how manipulative, how deceptive they are, you usually get what they think and what they really feel. Wow, Bill Dad, what a great help you've been. And this is helpful, as speaking as one who's given harsh counsel at times, it's helpful to be talked to like this. It kind of wakes you up of how you're being perceived. There's been times where my counsel's been a, a little too big. Big answers. Big principles. And ideals. Where I've gone on a little too long about it. Or my tone's been a little too condescending. And it's been helpful for them to, to talk straight. To wake me up out of that. Just this past week, John Piper says this about reading through Job. Extremely timely. 
He said, I'm reading through Job right now, and I just read a whole chapter from one of his friends this morning that just had me scratching my head because after I was reading it, I said, what's wrong with that? I mean, it's true. It's right. Well, what was wrong with it was it was ill-timed and it was lopsided. You could probably justify most of the things in Job by paralleling them with the Psalms. I think Job is in the Bible for many reasons, but one of them is to show that truth is not enough. That truth can be used unrighteously. I think Bildad's doing that here. But Job doesn't leave us to, to imagine what he thinks about God. He gives us a great view or a great articulation of his, his view of, of God. And in verse 5 through 13, the general flavor is, Bildad... God is doing things in places and in ways for His own glory and for His own reasons that we are clueless about. Not only do we not know what's going on, we don't even see it. And He gives a couple of of examples. The first, in verse 5, and I'll ask it to you. Right now, all the people who've died before all the people who have died and left us here, where are they at? Do you know? What are they doing right now? What's involved? What's it look like? How's it work? Do you know? You don't know. I don't know. I've got some verses here that give me a framework. But as far as the particulars, I don't know. That's what Job says. The dead tremble under the waters. And their inhabitants, Sheol, that's the place of the dead, is naked before God. And Abaddon, that's another synonym for Sheol, the place of the dead, has no covering. Meaning, God sees it. God knows it. He's there. He's at work. He knows all of it. And He doesn't explain everything to us. And He's in control of it. Or what about space? Think of it. The farthest reaches of space right now, and they tell us it's expanding and growing. And we've only got telescopes that can go so far. What's out there where nobody can be and see? God's out there. And He's doing things. And He's involved. He stretches out the north over the void. And He hangs the earth on nothing. How's how's that about biblical accuracy? This was before they knew anything about what we know about the solar system. And the void. And how the earth is just suspended in it. He also has a spherical earth. This is before. Circle on the face of the waters, I think, is what that is in verse 10. He stretches out the north over the void, hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds. The cloud is not split open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over its clouds. It's his cloud. He's inscribed a circle on the face of the water. The boundary between light and darkness The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. And all the way down through there. I love that verse. It's it's, these verses. It's beauty. It's epic. It's huge. It's big. It's beyond anything we know. And where is God? Right there in it. Dealing with it. Overseeing it. And I love verse 14. Look at this. Behold, when it comes to the afterlife... And when it comes to the farthest reaches of our universe, these are but the outskirts of his ways. How small a whisper do we hear of him? Job says, you want to look out in the greatest telescopes that our technology can, can see. We've got one star in our solar system, but apparently there are billions of stars in our galaxy, or solar systems in our galaxy. And billions and billions of galaxies. Job says, just a whisper of his greatness. Just the little frayed edge of his person. And when you think of that, look how he, how he sums up the verse. The thunder of his power, who can understand? Again, let's hear from Tozer, from his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, which is a must-read. 
about that thick, just tiny little thin book. It'll take you a year to get your head around it. Without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God, and the weightiest word in any language is, is its word of, uh, for God. A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. The Christian conception of God, current in these middle years of the 20th century, it's equally valid today, is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God and actually to, con to constitute for professed believers something amounting to a moral calamity. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. It simply gets a wrong answer to the question, what is God like? And goes on from there. Therefore, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate its concept of God until it is once more worthy of Him and of it. In all its prayers and labors, this should have first place. We do the greatest service to the next generation of Christians by passing on to them undimmed and undiminished that noble concept of God that we received from our Hebrew and Christian fathers of generations past. This will prove of greater value to them than anything that art or science can devise. That's why theology is called and has been called the queen of the sciences. When we are developing our children, we th rightly think of their academic uh, progress, their physical development. But don't forget that you are giving them a worldview of God. That you are developing a human soul. That will have to face the creator who made them. So don't only train them, but train yourself to think theologically. Not culturally. Not emotionally, although it's right to have emotions. Stop living and basing your life and your words on what you want to be true, or you wish was true, or just seems true. Instead, begin to live your life based on what is true. What is true. It's, it's thinking God's thoughts after him. I want everybody to close their eyes with all of this un inscrutable language. If we're not careful, we'll overdo it and, and act like there aren't some essential things about God that we don't know or we can't understand. And the most central of those truths is regarding His Son, Jesus Christ. We can fathom that we've been created by God to know Him. We can, be, we can fathom that we are sinners that fall short of glorifying Him, which means valuing Him as we ought. Therefore, we're under the penalty of His, his justice and His wrath. But he has told us that God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's not inscrutable. Not a word in there that's hard to understand. So, so simple that eight-year-olds can memorize it and believe it. This unfathomable, inexhaustible God so loves you that Jesus died for your sin and rose from the grave so that when you simply, in prayer, call on His name in faith, your sins are forgiven and you have eternal life. You don't have to understand how that works or what you'll do there. You simply believe the good news of Christ and He's yours.
God, in the words of the hymn writer, you are immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most bless, blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as trees on the leaf, or excuse me, as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Thank you for making yourself known truly, rightly, and personally. As simple created beings, we strive rightly to understand you more and more and grow in grace and knowledge and wisdom. But we do this, this orthodox theology humbly, knowing that it is our destiny as believers to pass from death to eternal life and even there learn more go deeper love fuller and be happier and then the next day of eternity we'll do it again and on and on into eternity as your people I pray that everyone in here, here in this room under the sound of my voice will be in that group. And that comes as they call on Christ. Give them faith to do so now. It's in His name we pray. Redemption Church said. So as we've learned today, like the God who set the stars and built the earth, he does much more than just exist, but he comes into it with us and it becomes personal and loves us. And even though he's big and outside of everything, he chooses to know us and love us deeply. And right now we're going to dive into our personal relationships with him through communion. So we're going to get ready to take communion together now and if you don't have one of the little cups that uh has like the little cracker and the juice in it there's some of those by the pallet wall and um so remember this this is for christians and if you're not a christian don't partake in this but if you are and if or if you're not go ahead and now and receive christ and take in this with us because this is for god's people <clears throat> let me find this here so in first corinthians Paul tells us when he has given thanks, sorry, let me backtrack there. On God, Jesus on the night when he betrayed, when he was betrayed, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So some, in a couple of minutes, some music is going to start playing. So just take some time to search your hearts and confess sin to God and reflect on everything that he has done for you in Christ. Thank you.
it was so good, I thought I was recording. Well done. <laughs> you deserve a compliment every now and then. Every now and then. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, my name is Rory. I'm the youth leader here. I have good news and I have great news. All right? Good news. Kids' classes resume next week. Woo! Almost all ages, yes. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. Oh. Next week, kids' classes resume. That's the good news. Ages 2 through pre-K are going to be in one class, and then ages kindergarten through 5th grade. We're not doing K through 2. We're doing K through 5. The whole shebang. Next week. The great news is we need volunteers. <laughs> gotcha. So there's two kinds of people who would be good to volunteer in the kids' classes, those who have kids and those who don't. <laughs> if you have kids, you receive the blessing of free child care so that you can hear the gospel every week and so you're on the hook if you don't have kids you have the blessing of receiving the teaching and hearing of the gospel without children around to distract you for there there from so there you go see miss holly martin she's right there way there by holly you can go see her if you're interested in volunteering in the kids classes either pre-k or k through five and she will lead you in the right direction and in addition to that, um, if you're looking to connect in any way, take one of those connect cards in front of you. I see a lot of new faces. Please don't fall through the cracks. Please don't just go out the back door. Take one of those connect cards, fill it out, put it in the give box, or you can download our app, Redemption WV. You can fill out a connect card there. Someone will follow up with you as you indicate. And then last but not least, no youth group tonight. Watch the Super Bowl with your family or your friends or whoever you want, and uh, we'll be back next week. All right, go ahead and stand. Each week, normally what I do is um, I'll write a benediction. But this week I think it would be best to just hear from the mouth of the Lord himself, the inscrutable, the unsearchable God that we worship. You'll never be able to plumb the depths of the knowledge of God, even when you're perfect, even when you're without sin, even when you've got your whole eternity ahead of you, it will take an eternity before you get to the bottom. This is how this God relates to us. In Numbers chapter 6, God tells Aaron, the high priest, he says, this is how I want you to relay what I'm like to the people of Israel. This is how I want you to bless them every time they worship, every time they come together. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This inscrutable, unsearchable God, his face shines upon you this morning. Go now in his peace. Amen. Go Bucks.